let's all stand for worship on this beautiful Mother's Day. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along, and you put me back together.
together wish some mothers a happy Mother's Day. Jesus 
God, you are the only thing that is so sure in our lives that we can hold on to. God, we want to know you deeper so that at the end of our day, we can say, hey, this is my story. And it all revolved around what God was doing in my life, how he changed me, how he saved me. There's nothing more important than that to us, God. So be with us this morning as we draw closer to you, as we lean into what you have to say to us today, God. I pray that you give us the ears to hear whatever it is you want to say. We love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. Amen. Hey, good morning, church. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here today. And if you are joining us, we would love for you to check in. Go to the Church Center app and let us know what service you're at, how you're watching, and who you are with. This helps us out a lot to know that you're here and how you're watching. And if this is your first time or if you don't have the Church Center app, you should download it. It gives you updates throughout the week of things that are happening here at the church and allows you the capability to check in every Sunday morning. On Sunday, May 7th, we held our first bilingual roundtable here at Emmanuel. Through this experience, we learned that we have many different languages represented throughout our congregation. At this event, people were able to share their unique stories and experiences about what it's like to be multilingual within their families and within this culture. We look forward to the next bilingual roundtable and for another opportunity to get together and show how God has created us all in different and unique ways. Membership class is coming up this Saturday, May 20th, here at Emmanuel at our Office Center Conference Room. Our lead pastor, Pastor Mark, will be in the Office Center Conference Room this Saturday from 9 to noon to help everybody learn more about what it means to become a member here at Emmanuel. We will discuss the beliefs of the Nazarene Church, the mission and value of Emmanuel, and so much more. Now to become a member, you have to go through starting point class, going deeper, and the membership class, but it does not matter the order that you do that in. So if you're interested in becoming a member, membership class could be your first step, or this could be your last step of becoming a member. Either way, if you're interested in membership and you wanna be a part of this class, go to the groups tab on our website or on the app and sign up there. Families of children and teens, we have an event coming up just for you. Our Family Appreciation Day is coming up Sunday, May 21st, right after second service here at Emmanuel. We know that raising a family can be challenging and rewarding, and we want to have an event to celebrate and encourage you. After church, we will be having food, fun, good conversation, and awesome entertainment for our kids, including a bouncy house. So we wanna make sure you're here to enjoy it all. If you're interested, make sure you sign up for this event on our events tab so that we know you're here, so that we can make sure we have all the food that you and your family needs. So make sure you sign up and come join us for this awesome event. Our registration deadline is this Wednesday, May 17th, so make sure you go online, go on the app, and register to make sure you have a spot. Coming up next month on Sunday, June 11th, we will be having child dedications in service. Child dedication is a commitment you make as a parent to raise your child to know God as you see grace and wisdom through this incredible journey. If you are thinking about child dedication, you can go to the website lansdale.church slash kids and scroll down until you see child dedications. You can sign up there and find more information. Hey ladies, we are so excited about the event that's coming up here at Emmanuel Church, June 2nd and 3rd. It's called the If Gathering, and it's a time where we're gonna be able to get together right here on campus. You come here Friday night. That sounds so we'll good. spend the evening all together, go home, get some sleep, get a shower, come back in the morning, yep. and we're gonna spend the day with, like you said, large group teaching that will be video-based. So right. we're gonna watch Same. the teaching together as a large group, but then we'll be in small groups for the weekend. Yep being able to kind of unpack like the things that they're talking about yeah. and how do we apply that to our, our lives in small group conversation. If you know some of these names, Jenny Allen, one of my favorites, uh, she wrote the book, Find Your People, which we just did a study on. Yep. Um, some other great names, Christine Kane, she's a powerhouse preacher. We've got John Mark Comer, we've got David Platt, Ann Voskamp. I mean, there's like 
a lot of really great speakers that are coming to share. Um, and an incredible time of worship, mm -hmm. which is gonna be led by Christy Knuckles uh, via simulcast. And it's it's just gonna be awesome. Like you are not going to wanna miss this weekend if you're a woman. You gotta be there, sign Let's up go. today. Great, hope to see you there. And as always, if there's any information that you want more of or any announcements you might have missed, you can check out our bulletin. They are available in person by each exit door, or you can go to our homepage on our website and our online bulletins are available there with all the same information. And Emmanuel, if you would like to give this morning, then there are multiple ways to do so. On the website, we have lansdale.church slash give, which is our giving page. Uh, we also have a giving page on the app. You can just go to the give section there. Or if you're in person, you can drop your donations off in the receptacles. There's one by each exit and one out in the lobby as well where you can put your physical donations. Again, Emmanuel, we thank you for all that you give and all you continue to give. And if you are new here today, we ask that you don't give. We just want you to receive today what we have to give for you, what the Lord has to give for you before you ever feel that you have to give in return. Well, that's all from me today, Emmanuel. I hope you are having a great Sunday and let's continue with service. Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to those of you in the room. We wanted to just take a few minutes to honor and celebrate the women in our church who have been, who've had the privilege of being a mother. Um, whether you've given birth to a child or you've fostered a child or you've adopted a child or you've been a second mom or a mentor to one that needed one. We see you and we are grateful for your investment. Um, you just heard on the video announcements, we're doing a women's conference. It's coming up in just a few weeks. And so we thought this morning it would be cool if we gave a couple women in the room a free registration to our conference. It's got a value of, I think, $50. Um, so I just want you to look in the seat back pocket. If you see a card like this, and we did kind of tuck it in there. There's two in the room. I kind of know general area. If you'll look. And if you're a guy and you find it, then you're going to have to find a woman in your life to give it to or the person sitting next to you. So just look for that. It's kind of a card like this. I want to say there's one somewhere in that area and somewhere in that area. So it's tucked behind the little like things you fill out. So look for it. And if you want to look, check other seat pockets. That's totally cool. We will not judge you at all. If you want to get up and run around the room, feel free. I think I see one, but is there one over there? Do you have? Yes, we have one there. And I know there's one somewhere back there. We're trying to hit some of the back seats or maybe back. Oh, right here? Oh, you got to give a little shout. I was going to say that and I forgot. Do we got a shout back there? We're pointing. I see a man pointing to you. Yes. Awesome. Congratulations. Happy Mother's Day. That's good. You can clap for them. If you're listening online and you want to drop in the comments, uh, maybe who is a woman in your life, a mom figure, why she's a hero to you, I'm going to give another registration away two more online uh, after the services are done this morning, so don't miss that out. Um, in just a couple minutes, I'm going to pray over the women in the room, um, but I wanted to share just briefly, I will not take away from Pastor Mark's sermon this morning. Um, we're excited for that. A little bit of my heart on Mother's Day. Um, as, a, as a child, I envisioned a lot of things for my life. Infertility was not one of them. Um, I didn't know how it would change the course of my life, uh, how it would change how we went about life. About seven to eight years into our marriage, my husband and I uh, decided to start a family and found out that it just wasn't as simple as it sounded. Uh, after a lot of years of struggling for, with infertility and then pursuing some medical treatment, uh, we kind of came up empty. And I found myself struggling with just a deep brokenness and questioning where God was in the middle of it. So that journey led to um, another long journey, and I'm sorry, like all morning I have felt emotional. Towards international adoption, we've adopted two kids from two different countries, Ethiopia and India, um, both of whose mothers chose to give them life. And I have the privilege of parenting. So to say that Mother's Day is complicated for me would be the understatement. The truth is my journey of inf infertility, which hopefully someday I'll get to share the whole story because it's a story. It's changed me and it's changed my perspective on life. It's changed my dependency on God. It's given me a passion for orphans that I didn't know I had inside of me. It's taught me what it means to choose joy in the midst of hard circumstances. It's taught me gratitude. 
It's allowed me to be a voice for women who may struggle for various reasons on Mother's Day. And so there's a prayer that I just want to pray, and I want to invite you, wherever you are, to just close your eyes, wherever you find yourself. To those who have just had your first child, may God grant you favor as a new mom, and may you find tons of joy in the days to come. To those of you who have lost your mom this past year, may you find joy in knowing that the one who your mom is celebrating with in heaven is the same one who embraces you today. For those of you who have lost a child or miscarried this past year, may you feel the arms of Jesus wrapped ever so tight around your heart, and may you cling to the hope that your story isn't finished. To those of you who are in the thick of parenting and struggling to survive, may you find a fresh surge of energy, words of encouragement, and take take in the reminder that you are doing a great job. To those of you whose relationship with your mom feels non-existent, may you feel loved by your creator God and understand that you have value. You were made for something great and you are special. To those of you who aren't even married yet, may you know and experience the peace that comes from the one who is truly the author of your story. To those moms whose children are struggling with addiction, may you know and understand the richness of God's grace and the strength that comes from letting go of control. To those of you who serve as mentors, encouragers, second moms, and fill-in moms, may you realize that your impact is far greater than anything you'll ever see. To those of you who have lost your mom to a battle with cancer, may you be overwhelmed by God's love today and rest knowing that he will never let you go. To those of you who have been dealt the card of infertility, may you hold fast to the truth that God's story is far greater than you can imagine. And remember, you have not been forgotten and you are loved. To those of you like my own kid's mom who made the hard decision to give up your child, may God's graciousness and love seep into the very depths of your soul in a way that you begin to understand that you're precious, valued, and loved. No matter where you find yourself this morning, know that we stand with you, we celebrate you, we are praying God's blessing over your life. You are loved, you are seen, you are valued. May you sense the goodness and faithfulness of a God who continues to author your story, a story that's far greater than you'd ever be able to write yourself. Amen and amen. I want to thank Andrea for opening up her heart and being vulnerable and making this moment very special. We're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the closest thing to Jesus' manifesto. What is a manifesto? It's an articulation of beliefs. And so the Sermon on the Mount is really about what Jesus is saying life in his kingdom is all about. So we've looked at the Beatitudes and we've looked at the hard sayings of Jesus. The Beatitudes are all about character and your heart. And the hard sayings of Jesus follow the Beatitudes and they're really about your conduct. How do you live out your character? And this morning I want to begin a new series called Prayer Works. And we're going to spend three weeks looking at the Lord's Prayer. Prayer, at best, is a mystery, and at worst, it's intimidating. Someone has said, the longer you pray, the more you realize you're a beginner. There are people in this room and people online who have been walking with Jesus for 40 or 50 years. And the more they pray, the more they realize the mysterious nature of prayer, and the more they realize how much they have to learn and to grow. When you stop and think about it, prayer is intimidating because you're praying to the God of the universe. 
And what would this God of the universe, what do you have to say to him that's of any great meaning and substance? And then we look through the Old Testament, the New Testament, we realize that prayer oftentimes is about encouraging the Lord to change his mind. How do you ask the God of the universe to change his mind? And yet, actually, that's what prayer is oftentimes about. God, I don't know about this, but can you do that? And so prayer is a real challenge for each of us. And this series over the next three weeks is going to comprise of me just focusing on the Lord's Prayer and asking us to demystify it, to kind of understand that prayer isn't way up out there and can't be understood. Prayer is actually nothing more than a conversation between two people who love each other. And so we're going to learn to pray by looking at how Jesus prayed. And also, at the end of this message, we're going to spend some time practicing praying. So turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 10. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 through 10. Would you stand, please? Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Do not be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Let's bow our heads. Holy Spirit, would you teach us to pray like Jesus? Would you help us to lean into your heart today? For those in the room who are new followers, who are just unsure and trying to figure it out, for those in the room and online who have been walking with you for decades, help us to see new things and re-engage to experience you in deeper ways. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So when I was in seminary, I was taught that whenever you go to preach a message on a particular passage of Scripture, try to boil it down to one sentence. Sometimes that's really hard to do. But here's my one sentence when it comes to the Lord's Prayer. Prayer is a privilege because we get to talk to the one who loves and cares for us the most. Now, you see it up on the screen there. Can we just all say it together? You ready? Prayer is a privilege because we get to talk with the one who loves and cares for us the most. So this message consists of that sentence divided in half. So let's look at the first part. Prayer is a privilege. Jesus said in verse 5, when you pray. There must have been something compelling about the way that Jesus prayed because the disciples, after watching Jesus prayed, said, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus would oftentimes get away from the crowd. He would spend seasons of prayer together uh, together with his father, and then he'd come back, and unbelievable things would happen. I mean, demons would be cast out of people. People would be healed. 
His teaching had power and authority. There was something compelling about the way that Jesus conversed with his father that made the disciples lean in and say, we want to have that too. To Jesus, prayer was not an addendum, a tack-on to his ministry. It was the lifeblood of his power, authority, and identity. In other words, it wasn't, prayer wasn't something Jesus had to do. It was something Jesus got to do. Do you know the difference between the two? Let me ask you a question. Is your prayer life a should or a want? I think for many of us, we think about our prayer life and we think, oh, I know I should pray more. We even use verbiage like that. Oh, you know, I, I should do this. I, you know, I shouldn't be watching so much Netflix. I should be spending more time in prayer. And we actually reduce a privilege to a religious obligation and duty. Now, by the time that Jesus arrived on the scene in Judaism, religious leaders had sucked the joy and the spontaneity out of prayer and made it a religious activity, a ritual. I guess here's my question this morning. If prayer is really a privilege, first and foremost, not a duty, not a ritual, not an obligation, how do we keep it or make it that privilege? How do we pray leaning into our Father who loves us and cares for us the most? How do we not make it a religious duty? I think there's, there's, there's two things that Jesus said, two don'ts and one do. So let's take a look at the two don'ts first. Don't make it about you. Verses five and six say, those who love to pray publicly and on street corners and on the synagogues where everybody can see them. The longer that you are a Christ follower, the more that you'll be tempted to reduce prayer from a heartfelt relationship to a conversation and make it a religious performance. Have you ever faked it? Have you ever sounded more religious in your prayers, but deep on the inside, you felt disconnected to God? Do you look at prayer as a religious activity? So a few weeks ago on my Facebook feed, this video popped up. And this video was about a worship leader. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. But it was about a worship leader, and it was a satirical video. Now, do you know what a satire is? Right? Satire is a purposeful, humorous exaggeration to poke fun at usually a distorted truth that needs to be corrected. So let's watch this video. All right, when you're jumping, we're gonna go one foot here, this foot, kind of like hopscotch, hopscotch when you're a kid. And if that gets tiring, because this is living as a long song, all right, to go to knee bounces. Knee bounces, knee bounces, hand raise. So the way this song's broken down is we're gonna go verse one, verse two, chorus, verse three, chorus, chorus, Bridge, 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 chorus, chorus, chorus. During the verses, just right here, just back and forth right here. And then I want you to kind of giggle as if God whispered the funniest joke in your ear, just. <laughs> and then once that chorus hits, boom, full extension. Thank you guys so much for just being a part of the team this week. Really love that you're here using your talents. I'm sorry that this is the fruit spread we got. I promise next week we're trying to get Chick-fil-A. We'll make it happen, so. All right, church, we're standing on our feet and worship the Lord tonight. We're just so glad to be in his presence, so let's go for it. Yeah, he went to a Hillsong concert like one time. You hold the mic way out here because you can't sing and you're only on this team because I'm trying to marry you. It's bridge, 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 chorus, chorus, down verse one. Gosh, God's love is so good. Sorry, I just, I just get so distracted by it. What was the question? These? No, they're not prescription. We poke fun at it, right? But this is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were making church a performance and making prayer and making worship a performance, and they had lost connection with the head. Why? Because they were making religious activity really about them. So here's the question. How do you make prayer about you? Two things. One is we make prayer about us when we pray to people rather than to God. 
Okay, what does that mean? We pray to people rather than to God. See if this sounds familiar to you. Oh, God, thank you so much for your presence today. We just want to thank you for the privilege of having a youth activity tonight at 6 o'clock in the worship center where there will be a teen fundraiser for Nazarene Youth Congress. Does God need to know that the youth activity is at 6 o'clock in the worship center and that there's going to be a fundraiser? Okay, am I the only one who has ever said grace at the table when the kids were fighting? Oh, God, help us to be mindful of the fact that you are a loving God and that you call us to love each other. What are we doing? We're making prayer about us. We're not praying to God. We're praying to other people. Here's another one. Trying to impress others with our prayers. Embarrassing story, but it's true. A couple weeks ago, we had our district assembly. I don't know if you know this, but our church is part of a denomination called the Church of the Nazarene, and it's broken up into 50-some districts across America, and we're part of the Philadelphia District Church of the Nazarene. And once a year, we have a big gathering together. It's kind of a business meeting, but it's also kind of a worship time, and it's, it's just a cool time to get together. And it was held over about eight miles away at the Fairview Village Church of the Nazarene, and it was great. So I had some responsibilities on Friday, Thursday night. I had a couple of responsibilities on Friday, and I dressed appropriately. And on Saturday, I had no responsibilities whatsoever, so I dressed down a little bit. I figured I'm, I'm not going to do anything publicly, so I'll just kind of have a relaxed attire. So the president of Eastern Nazarene College was giving his kind of his address of how the college is going. And at the end of his address, the district superintendent spontaneously said, hey, is Pastor Mark Prue in the room? Could he come forward and, and just have a prayer time and pray over our president? The first thing that came to my mind was, oh, man, I'm not wearing the right shirt. If I would have known that, I would have worn a different shirt. I shouldn't be going up on the platform. I'm not dressed appropriately. Some of you are thinking, you're still not dressed appropriately. <laughs> Why is it that when we're asked to do something, this privilege called prayer, the first thing we do is we begin to think about, you know, what do I look and how do I sound and, oh, what am I going to say? And while the introduction was going on, I'm just kind of standing over there, look spiritual, but I'm really thinking, I have no idea what to pray over. What, what should I say? And so I'm just kind of like making it about me. Secondly, Jesus says, don't do this. Don't go on babbling and babbling and praying mindlessly. Well, what does it mean to pray on and on and on and babble away? Well, a couple scenarios. Have you ever caught yourself praying without engaging your mind, just using whatever words or phrases that roll off your lips? There's this great story in Acts about Peter in prison about to be executed like the next day. And the early believers were gathered at Mark's house in Jerusalem praying for the release of Peter. They had just killed James, and Peter was about to be killed. A miracle happens, and an angel comes to the prison, and there's a prison break. And the chains fall off of Peter, and Peter thinks it's a dream, like he's having a vision of being released. You ever had a dream that was so real that you, you know, you know, it was just so intense that you thought it was real? And so that's exactly what Peter thought. But when Peter is standing outside of the prison, he realizes it's not a vision. It actually happened. Then he goes to John Mark's house where all the disciples are praying and a little servant girl, he's knocking on the door, right? And a little servant girl comes, sees that it's Peter, slams the door on Peter, 
and runs back and tells everybody Peter is outside. And the people who are praying, the early church, the apostles for crying out loud, go, no, it's not Peter. Come on, let's keep praying for Peter. And she's like, no, 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 really, 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 it's Peter. It must be the spirit of Peter who's coming to the door. So she had to talk him into letting Peter in. And then finally Peter comes in, and they're all like, oh, that's unbelievable. God really answered our prayer. Sometimes we pray mindlessly. We just say whatever words or phrases come to our mind, and we're actually not really engaged. How about this? We go on babbling and babbling when we say the same old worn, well-worn phrases or cliches over and over and over again. If someone can predict what you're going to say in prayer, it's time to shake up your prayers. Praying but not being aware that you're in the presence of God. Praying with no anticipation that your prayers are going to be answered. Thinking that long prayers are better prayers. I'm not a very good prayer because, you know, I can only come out with a couple sentences. Interestingly, I did a quick word study here. Do you know that Jesus' instructions before the Lord's Prayer are 161 words of instruction? The Lord's Prayer itself is 61 words. Jesus talks more about prayer and actually does less praying. I don't know why, but I feel like that's an encouragement. Because you don't have to have all the right phrases. You don't have to have a long prayer. We look at somebody that prays for five or ten minutes and we just say, oh, they're a great prayer. Well, I don't know. Maybe they're just slinging together a whole bunch of cliches. You don't know. Third, so there's two don'ts. The third is do pray with confidence because you know that God already knows what you need before you ask. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us come boldly through. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. A couple days ago, our six-year-old grandson, Paxton, called up his Mimi, Holly, and said, Mimi... I want some of your brownies. And can, you, can you make some brownies for me? Now, they live in Erie. Oh, Mimi, I like the brownies that you make. I especially like the brownies with M&Ms in them. Holly runs out to the store, gets a brownie mix, package of M&Ms, makes brownies, you're not going to touch any of those brownies, Mark, are you? Puts them in the mail. I found the receipt from the postal office. It's $14 <laughs> to mail $4 worth of brownies. I was about to say something to Holly and then thought, I like my bed. Now, moms, you get it. Mimi's, if it's within your power and you hear a little voice saying, I want brownies, this is prayer. Let us, be, let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God so that we can receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. What comes to mind when you think about God? A.W. Tozer used to say, the most important thing about you is what comes to mind when you think about God. What comes to your mind when you think about God? Do you think about God as being distant or close? Loving or vengeful? Absent or engaged? What you think about God is the most important thing about you. That's the first part of the sentence. Prayer is a privilege. The second part of the sentence is because we get to talk to the one who loves and cares for us the most, our Father. When Jesus thought about God, he thought about his daddy. That is the word for father here. 
It's daddy. It's an intimate term. Because he saw his father as the one who loved him unconditionally. You remember in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist and a dove come down from heaven and there's a voice from heaven that says, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. That is before Jesus healed anybody. Before he gave his first message. Before he taught anybody. In other words... Jesus receives from his Father perfect and unconditional admiration and love, and Jesus hasn't done anything yet. And these are exactly the words that your daddy wants you to hear as well. So I journal my prayers, not all of them, but many of them. And the reason why I journal my prayers is because it's almost the only way I can stay focused. You ever sit down to pray and your mind just goes a hundred different directions? And you get so frustrated because you can't even keep a, a straight thought. So I've learned through the years to just keep a journal. So every day I write a letter to God, dear God. And those are my prayers. I had a little moment of insight a couple days ago, and so I want to read to you a portion of my journal entry from Wednesday. The only reason we don't long to pray and spend time with God is because we've forgotten or are not convinced that God really loves us as much as what he says he does. Because we naturally want to be with those who love us. Our time with those whom we love often varies. It could be a relaxing time in each other's presence with little or no speaking, just enjoying each other. It could be a time of doing an activity together like walking or riding a bike or working on a project. It could be a time of crisis when we run to each other because we need comfort and healing. Or it could be sharing intense, intimate moments. It's the same way with God. Prayer is spending time with the one who loves and cares for us the most. And if we don't long to spend time with God, it has to be that we have forgotten or we are not convinced that God loves us as much as what he has told us he does. Now, in my mind, when I wrote those words, I thought, is that really true? If I don't long to pray, if I don't long to have my devotions, is it because I'm really not convinced that God loves me as much as what he says he does? And so I went through in my mind all these scenarios, all of the excuses that I use for not praying more, all the excuses that I use for, oh, I skipped my devotional time because I was just too busy with, and every single one of them came back to the fact, no, it's actually because I don't believe that God loves me as much as what he says he does. Because God has built you and me to long to be around people who love us. We are naturally drawn to people who really love us. And if we're not drawn to God, it's because we've forgotten or are simply not believing that God loves us as much as what he says he does. There's another part to this idea of God being our father and listening to the words, you are my beloved With you, I am well pleased. Did you know that we have another father? We have a heavenly father, but we actually have another father. And this other father, Jesus refers to in John chapter 8, verses 42 through 44. Jesus told them, speaking to the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. 
You are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is the father of lies. It struck me a couple weeks ago that you always have two father's voices in your head. You have the loving father that wants you to hear, you are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. This father is life-giving. This father is full of mercy. This father is full of grace. This father is full of tenderness towards you. But you and I have another father. And this other father, Jesus says, John chapter 10, verse 10, it's the words that everybody wants to hear. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life, life to the full or abundant life. You've heard me say that many times through the years. You know what verse 9 says? We all want the abundant life that Jesus has. Verse 9, which is just before, obviously, verse 10, it says that the devil comes to still ki- steal, kill, and destroy. And that is this. We have an- another father who is dark, who doesn't encourage you, who doesn't want you to hear that you are the beloved, who is always telling you you're not enough. You can't do it. You cannot overcome that addiction. This father is always putting voices in your head to pull you away from God and to tell you that you are not loved. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, which father are you going to listen to? And today, you have to ask yourself, are you listening to the wrong father? Because what I've discovered is, even though I know my heavenly father, the other father doesn't always go away. And what I have to do is, I have to spend more time with my heavenly father to drown out the voice of the other father. And you have to make a choice of which father you're going to listen to. Now, as we learn to pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, something remarkable happens. Our desires actually change, and we want God's kingdom to come, and we want his will to be done in our lives, in our homes, and in our communities, because we know that he is good And we know he has our best interests at heart. And he knows that he can be trusted with our deepest desires and wounds. We can pray confidently to our heavenly daddy. Because he loves and cares for us the most. One more Paxton story. I'm probably going to get an email on this one. I learned a couple years ago that you could play virtual video games by your phones to anywhere in the world, to another person. And so Paxton and I play the old battleship game on our phones. They call it Sea Battle today. So I downloaded this app, and he downloaded that app, and... We ping each other when we make a move. So he's on his phone. Actually, he's six years old. He doesn't have a phone, but he has an iPad. And he's on his iPad, and he makes his move to send a torpedo to sink one of my battleships. And I get a ping on my phone that it's my move. Now, here's the thing that's going to generate emails. No matter where I'm at, I always respond. If I'm in a meeting, I'll stop the meeting and I'll make my move. If I'm in sermon preparation and there's a ping on my phone and he's made his move, I stop my sermon preparation and I make my move. Two weeks ago, I'm standing here worshiping. 
I hear a ping. And I think to myself, who could possibly be reaching out to me in the middle of worship? He made a move. (laughs) So I put my hands down. I sunk one of his battleships. (laughs) Put my phone in the pocket and went back to worshiping. He did it again. I felt a little vibration. Pull my phone out. My thought is, isn't he in worship too? But I don't care because he's my grandson. So I make my move. Just as I walk up on the platform to preach. I hope that doesn't sound too disrespectful. But I want to stay connected with my grandson. And if he wants to connect with me, I'm going to drop everything to connect with him. Even if it means laying down some other activity. You understand what I'm saying, right? That is our heavenly father. That is the very nature of prayer. Prayer is a privilege because we get to talk with the one who loves and cares for us the most. And if God had an iPhone, God's dropping it and just going, ooh, so he can respond to you. I don't think you think that that's true. I think we have a hard time believing that God stops just to hear from us, but he does. So here's what I think these next few moments are going to, could look like. We're going to put this into practice. Jesus says in verse 9, pray like this. Okay. A couple thoughts. One is, do you have a meaningful relationship with your heavenly daddy, or are you following the father of this world? If you're going to have a meaningful prayer life, then you're going to have to decide who's your daddy. That's what it really boils down to. And do you have a meaningful relationship with your heavenly daddy? Or are you listening to some other voice in your head? Settle that one first. And then relax. Your heavenly daddy has your best interests at heart. Don't be concerned about technique. Just be sincere. We get caught up in technique all the time. What's the right way to pray? Should I, should I pray standing, sitting, or kneeling? Should I close my eyes in prayer, or should I open my eyes in prayer? You know, the Bible never says anything about closing our eyes in prayer. I don't know where we got that from. I think we think that it's more respectful to bow our heads and close our eyes, and that's how I grew up. But there's no place in Scripture that ever says that. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to just keep your eyes open and be aware while you're praying. Be intentional with your words. Tell Daddy what you're feeling and what you want. In other words, be childlike. And then lastly, listen, is God saying anything back to you? So these next few moments, we're just going to pause. The worship team will come up in a minute, but not now. And I want to give you an invitation to put into practice what I've just been talking about. Because we learn to pray by praying. We don't learn to pray by listening to another message. Another message could be helpful, but we actually learn to pray by praying. So I'm going to sit down for a few minutes. If you would like to come to the altar, you can come to the altar. If you want to kneel where you're at, go ahead and kneel where you're at. If you want to stand, you can go ahead and stand. You can do whatever you want to do. This is just unscripted time. If you're home watching online, same thing applies to you. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel. You can make an altar in your home. Just turn a chair around and just kneel down. You can make that your altar. But here's my encouragement to you. 
it's time to talk to and listen to your heavenly Father who loves and cares for you the most. Why wouldn't you want to lean into somebody who loves you that much? If you've come with some burdens this morning, if Mother's Day is not a great day for you, you should spend some time in prayer and just tell the Lord all about it. So just mind God and do whatever he wants you to do. We'll take a few moments. Would you stand, please? God, this mystery called prayer. Is beautiful. Because we're praying to our daddy. You. And over these next few weeks, as we just spend some time focusing on the privilege that we have to communicate well with you, our lifeblood, not a tack on the very core of who we are, hearing your voice, talking with you. Help our conversation to become more real, more vibrant, more delightful, more beautiful.
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That is our prayer this morning. We know that we are in desperate need of you. So God, call us this week to get closer to you, to continue to have conversations with you and hear what you have to say. God, we know that you are just waiting to speak with us. Your love for us is amazing. So God, we thank you for all that you're doing and all that you promise to continue to do. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Hey, thanks for worshiping with us. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>